thanks for stopping by the YouTube version of A Science Story. And in future episodes there will be a video component as well, but for now this is just the audio, so play it in the background, while you're working, while you're working out, on your commute to work. I just wanted to let you know, so anyways, here it is. Hey everyone, I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you may be. My name is Wyatt and welcome to A Science Story. There are amazing stories behind almost all scientific discoveries, no matter how big or how small that deserve to be told. Before we get started, I just wanted to remind you that if you haven't subscribed, go hit that button so you never miss another episode or another opportunity to get smarter. If you like what you learned, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it so that we can spread the knowledge together. sitting in my genetics class in 2017, I was amazed by the things CRISPR could do. I learned about it in detail. It took up about a quarter of the entire semester. What's crazy is that if I had gone to school five years earlier, it wouldn't have even been a part of the curriculum. You may have heard of CRISPR, or maybe you haven't. If you haven't, it's inevitable that you would eventually hear about it. That's because it's one of the most important biological discoveries ever. But many people who aren't scientists have never even heard of it. Dr. Eric Lander of MIT and Harvard says that it is hard to recall a revolution that has swept biology more swiftly than CRISPR. Today we are going to learn about the story of how many scientists put together the pieces of a puzzle that could possibly change humanity forever. Before getting into CRISPR, let's get a quick brain refresh on how DNA works. DNA contains the building blocks for humans. There are about 20,000 different genes that make you who you are. These genes are made up of strings of different base pairs that can kind of be thought of as chemical computer codes. This code is translated into proteins that go on and do various things throughout the body to keep us running. There's for sure a lot more to it, but I think that should be good for now. Also, to aid you in this journey, I'll give you a broad overview of CRISPR as well. CRISPR is kind of like a genetic map that tells an enzyme called Cas9 where to cut DNA. With it, we can cut out certain parts of our DNA. The word CRISPR itself, that's C-R-I-S-P-R, is an acronym for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats. I don't want to spoil anything, so I'll leave it at that. It started when a Spanish researcher by the name of Francisco Mojica was the first to find the location of CRISPR in the DNA of bacteria back in 1993. He grew up on the beach and started studying a native bacteria named Haloferrax mediterraneae. Mojica examined some of the bacteria's DNA fragments and found an interesting shape that also had a repeated sequence. With no idea what this meant, the perplexed scientist spent the next 10 years of his career being dedicated to solving this mystery. Soon after, he spotted the repeats in many other bacteria and came to the conclusion that since it's conserved, it must be important. By 2000, he found the sequence pattern in 20 different microbes. Researchers also found other genes associated with CRISPR, such as the one that makes the enzyme Cas9 that will become important as we move forward. To make sure you're on track, and honestly myself as well, we're now in the early 2000s and we know what CRISPR is along with the genes that are associated with it, but not a whole lot else. It has been found in many different bacteria so we know that it must be important, but we don't quite know what it does yet. Mojica was becoming an expert in the emerging CRISPR field. He was consistently searching for matches to certain regions of the CRISPR DNA found in bacteria. There are actually online databases where you can go do this if you ever want a fun way to spend your evening. Mojica tried this a few times earlier with no luck, but the databases are constantly becoming updated as more and more organisms are studied. One day, he tried again and found a surprising match. Some of the sequence matched a common virus that infects the bacteria E. coli. To give Mojica even more credit, he was doing all this manually. In a week, he had manually typed in about 4,500 different sequences online to search for matches. 
I don't know about you, but there's no way my attention span would last that long. He also started to realize that the bacteria that had parts of the viral DNA were also immune to those specific viruses. It was at this point that Mojica realized that CRISPR must encode the instructions for bacteria to protect themselves against specific infections. So the repeats that are part of the acronym are small pieces of DNA from viruses the bacteria have encountered. It's a little something that a bacteria uses to remember the nasty virus by so that it can fight it the next time it comes around. It's kind of like a database the bacteria can pull from to defend itself. So when a virus comes into the bacteria and it has a match to one of those repeat units in the DNA, the bacteria somehow finds the match and is able to kill the virus. This is truly a beautiful act of nature. All of these bacteria already had a defense to common viruses encoded as a part of themselves. The finding was stunning and I can imagine Mojica going out with his friends and celebrating with maybe more than a few drinks. Or going to trivia night since, you know, he was a scientist. Here's another recap to keep us on track. At this point we know that CRISPR is a part of a gene that just repeats itself. These repeats in the bacterial gene match the genes of common viruses that the bacteria is immune to. Because of this information, we can infer that CRISPR encodes the bacteria's defense system against these viruses. Then began the journey of getting his findings known. Mojica wrote a paper detailing his findings and sent it to the journal called Nature, where it was rejected. A few others rejected it as well, saying that it lacked novelty and importance. Finally, after 18 months of rejections, revisions, and reviews, the Journal of Molecular Evolution accepted the paper and it appeared in public on February 1st, 2005. Other researchers had heard about what Mojica was doing and a few other papers started to pop up detailing different parts of CRISPR. These also faced the same rejection and trouble getting out to the public. In case you didn't know how research gets published, it's good to know that there are quite a few gatekeepers. And if your research isn't accepted by a journal, your career could possibly go nowhere. These scientists, and all scientists really, were taking risks by venturing out into never-before-seen territory. There was a scientist named Felipe Horvath who was researching bacteria used in making dairy products such as cheese and yogurt. The goal of the research was to learn more about the viruses that frequently attacked their bacteria and also how to overcome these attacks. Understanding how the bacteria protected themselves was of interest scientifically but also economically. Horvath learned about CRISPR at a lactic acid bacteria conference. A conference about lactic acid bacteria isn't necessarily something that I would willingly sign up for, but I guess you can learn some pretty useful stuff there if you're a biologist. In Horvath's research, he independently found a clear correlation between sequences within CRISPR and viral protection in the bacteria. He also did a lot of research on actually infecting bacteria with viruses. The ones that survived all had CRISPR sequences specific to the viral infection. After this finding, Horvath and his science buddies studied the role of an enzyme that works with CRISPR called Cas9. It turns out that Cas9 plays an active role in the bacteria's immune system by going after the virus, but they didn't exactly know how. This was done in 2007. Finally, the same group of scientists found that when a virus was able to kill the bacteria, it would only have this ability if the virus had some of its DNA mutated, meaning that the CRISPR-Cas9 system has a specific DNA match with its target, which in this case is the virus's DNA. So this is all great for bacteria. At this point in the story, it's just really us figuring out how bacteria fight off viruses. And not even all bacteria, just a few unique ones. Nature came up with that way, and it worked. But we figure out the amazing way nature works all the time. However, not all discoveries about nature have the possibility to change humanity like CRISPR. It's time to get into how we move towards humans. A microbial evolution expert named Eugene Koonin and a microbiologist with some extra grant money named John van der Oost teamed up. Koonin had already begun work classifying CRISPR after he heard about it from the previous stuff we've been talking about. What they did was really interesting. They started taking pieces of the CRISPR-Cas9 system from E. coli and then injected that into other E. coli that didn't have e CRISPR. 
They did this to see what each part did, and from this they could tell which parts were crucial and which ones didn't do as much. In 2008 they found some very important enzymes that tell us a lot about CRISPR. They noticed that CRISPR is transcribed into RNA that guides the enzyme Cas9 to the virus's DNA. RNA is pretty much a copy of DNA that the cell actually uses for various purposes. DNA is much too valuable and kind of hard to work with, so RNA is a good workaround. They then tested this even more in another interesting way. They designed four different viruses, and yes, you can actually design viruses, and then four different CRISPR sequences to match those viruses. What happened, you may ask? The bacteria brutally murdered the viruses just as the scientists had planned. It's really crazy what can be done with modern genetics. At this point, it wasn't known exactly what part of the DNA process was targeted by CRISPR, just that the process is disrupted. DNA is almost constantly replicating, being transcribed into messages to be used by the cell. That message is then being translated into proteins and many other things. There were a lot of potential targets for CRISPR. There were many guesses for where CRISPR does its work, and all but the hypothesis of Luciano Marafini were wrong. He immediately saw the importance of CRISPR being part of the bacterial immune system and started telling everyone he could about it. He was eager to move away from his home in Chicago to go work on CRISPR with one of the handful of groups doing research, but unfortunately, or fortunately depending on how you look at it, his wife just got a good job and he had to stay in Chicago. It's easy to forget that the people behind these discoveries are just people too. They have spouses, families, failures, and mistakes. Most stories are a highlight reel of a few scientists that got recognition, but there is much more to the story. Since moving was out of the picture, Marafini persuaded a biochemist at Northwestern named Eric Sontheimer to work with him on CRISPR. We knew indirectly that CRISPR targets DNA, but they were the first to do work that showed CRISPR specifically targeted DNA. They realized that CRISPR was programmable as well. Bacteria normally program it with information from invading viruses to protect them in the future, but it begs the question, what are the broader applications? From a practical standpoint, they declared, the ability to direct the specific addressable destruction of DNA that contains any given 24 to 48 nucleotide target sequence could have a considerable functional utility, especially if the system can function outside of its native bacterial or archaeal context. The paper detailing their finding was published in 2008, the same year as some research we talked about earlier. There was a lot of research exploding at this time. Along with this, they filled a patent to try and get the rights to use this on animals, but ultimately they didn't have enough research on its use. Although scientists knew that CRISPR targets DNA, the problem was that it was so efficient at destroying the DNA that we couldn't really understand what was going on. The breakthrough in figuring out how CRISPR acts on DNA came when another group involved with the dairy industry was working with bacteria called Streptococcus thermophilus. In this strain, CRISPR only gave partial protection against outside viral attacks, so instead of just trying to pick up all the pieces, we kind of had a 50-50 blend of it worked and it didn't work, so we could pick out what was happening. This allowed them to examine different stages of the CRISPR process, which showed that Cas9 was the enzyme responsible for cutting the invading DNA at very specific points. They came out with their findings in a research paper in 2010. I think it would be helpful for both you and me to wrap up what scientists have found by this point in the story. So CRISPR is just an acronym for a part of a certain bacteria's DNA that matches regions of the DNA for common viruses. There is then an enzyme called Cas9 that uses RNA from the CRISPR DNA to search out those viral matches and then cut the strands of the virus's DNA. Remember that RNA is just a message made from our DNA so that it's usable. This whole system serves as the immune system for just a few bacteria. We're getting into the weeds so for me it helps to have a more simple summary of what's going on. And there is a lot going on here. This podcast could go for hours if I got into the genetic techniques or all of the individual discoveries. It's amazing that a lot of this is happening simultaneously and how fast these discoveries were being made and still are today. All of the discoveries leading to where we are now relied on improving technology to give the scientists better and better data. 
A new technique would come out or a new software, for example, which would allow the scientists to save time and explore new areas that were impossible previously. Genetics is a quickly changing field and sort of like the wild west of science, among other areas of course. In July 2011, a scientist named Dr. Sixnes and his colleagues were able to clone the entire CRISPR-Cas9 DNA and insert it into a strain of E. coli that didn't have it. It turns out that this was able to make the E. coli resistant to viral attack, which means that everything CRISPR needs to work is held inside that little piece of DNA. After the whole process was documented in bacteria, scientists switched to testing CRISPR-Cas9 in test tubes. This made them able to mess around with different variables to get an even more in-depth look at the process. Sometimes relying on those little bacteria for everything muddies the waters a bit. In 2012, Dr. Sixnes started doing this and found specific areas where Cas9 would cut and then started changing the CRISPR sequence so that it would make changes where he wanted it to. Essentially, Sixnes found that CRISPR could be programmed by people to have Cas9 make precise cuts to DNA. He sent his paper to be published and, of course, like many others, it was rejected for a lack of importance. In hindsight, the editor admitted that it was a very important discovery and that he had made a mistake. Around the time of Sixney's discovery, a scientist who had been working with CRISPR for a while with a few different discoveries under her belt named Emmanuel Charpentier met another scientist named Jennifer Dudna. They met at an American Society for Microbiology meeting. These scientists and their conferences, I tell ya. Dudna was a world-renowned structural biologist and RNA expert at the University of California in Berkeley. She started using this expertise with Charpentier to show similar findings as Dr. Sixney's, which was that CRISPR could be programmed. They even came out with a paper very similar to that of Sixney's about two months later. Since Sixney's beat them to the punch, Charpentier and Dudna came out with a paper that expanded on the original idea later in 2012. So the work of these scientists gave a blueprint on how we can practically change the CRISPR to edit DNA in a test tube where we wanted it. The elephant in the room at this point was whether or not CRISPR could be used to edit the human genome and whether or not we should do this. In the 80s and 90s, we had already found ways to edit the human genome, but the processes were slow and inefficient so that it wasn't feasible on a large scale. Fang Zhang moved at the age of 11 from China to Des Moines, Iowa. Of all places, I don't know why you would choose Des Moines, but I guess it worked out for him. One Saturday, he got hooked on molecular biology during a small introduction course. By the age of 16, he was working 20 hours a week at the local gene therapy lab. He then went to Harvard where he became interested in the brain when a classmate underwent severe depression. Later, he pursued a PhD in chemistry under his mentor who was a neurobiologist. They developed a revolutionary technology called optogenetics. Without getting too deep into the details, essentially they found a way to use light to activate gene expression which helped neurons fire better. After this chapter, he wanted to expand his molecular toolbox and started exploring different gene editing technologies. After hearing a talk about CRISPR in 2011, he, like many other scientists, were hooked. He was so hooked that by the next day he had a flight booked to Miami so that he could be a part of a scientific meeting about CRISPR. Talk about dedication. He spent all his spare time researching CRISPR. Zhang had his mind set on coming up with a way to use CRISPR-Cas9 to edit human cells. In his early work, he decreased luminescence in human embryonic kidney cells by altering the CRISPR sequence to specifically target a gene called luciferase. Luciferase sounds kind of sinister, but it's really just a gene that gives luminescence in some human cells. This was a nice way to see that he could be successful because it's pretty obvious if it doesn't work. Since the gene gives luminescence, if you knock it out, there's just not going to be luminescence or it won't light up as much. He found that human cells could use this system found in bacteria, although not nearly as efficient as the bacteria. This isn't super surprising given that many bacterial processes don't work at all in humans. Luckily, with all of the research coming out, there were many different variations of CRISPR and its components to test to find what worked better and what worked worse. He found that depending on which organism Cas9 was coming from, it acted differently in human cells. 
Remember that CRISPR is sort of like the directions that tells the enzyme Cas9 where to cut DNA. By the middle of 2012, Zhang had pieced together a system from multiple bacteria that seemed to work pretty well. His system targeted 16 different sites in human DNA with efficiency and high accuracy. What he was doing is cutting out specific pieces of the human DNA, and then another piece would fuse the DNA back together. Zhang kept improving the system and even went as far as to use it in live mice. He showed that you could target anti-cancer parts of the mouse genome and delete them. When this was done, the mice would develop cancer in a matter of weeks. You may be thinking this is a bit cruel or backwards and we should be working towards curing cancer, not causing it. However, this was extremely important because a lot of our cancer research comes from studying it in mice. Now we could see how certain genes affected cancer growth and what we could do to fix it. In science, mice are much more than little pests that infest your lab, but rather crucial for scientific progress. I think we should all thank the next mouse we see. Zhang eventually submitted a paper and it appeared in the Journal of Science in the beginning of 2013, and to Zhang's surprise, it became the most cited paper in the field. Other scientists were also working on editing the human genome at the same time. A month after Zhang submitted his paper, another scientist named George Church also submitted a paper. He was an expert in genomics and synthetic biology and collaborated with Zhang. Dr. Church was no stranger to controversy. He had previous proposals to revive woolly mammoths and Neanderthals, which was aided in his work in developing ways to read and write our genome on a large scale. He wanted to continue this trend by editing mammalian cells. Some of his ideas were to genetically edit malaria-carrying mosquitoes so that they would die as the DNA spread, and also to genetically edit pigs for organ transplants so that there would be no transfer of disease from pig to human. Both of these sound like they would be awesome ideas, but there were arguments against it with concerns of disrupting entire ecosystems along with environmental concerns. But... Despite this, research kept moving forward with new avenues being explored every day. By this point in early 2013, CRISPR was going viral. Google searches on the topic skyrocketed, a trend that continues to this day. If you want to look at something really interesting, go to Google Trends and type in CRISPR. Remember that it is spelled C-R-I-S-P-R. Then set the settings to go back to about 2000, or even 2005 or 2008 for that matter and look at how much it skyrockets. If it were a stock and you invested it in the beginning, you'd be a trillionaire today and probably a quadrillionaire in the not too far future, if that even exists. By 2014, the genomes of many organisms had been edited, including yeast, nematodes, fruit flies, zebrafish, mice, and monkeys. But still, the elephant in the room was, and continued to be what can be done to humans and also what should be done to humans. Well, scientists have started to test CRISPR on human embryos. As of 2015, this has been done more than a few times, but at the same time, some of the largest science organizations in the world from even China, the United States, London, came together to make a decision that only changes that won't be passed down can be made. This is a pretty strong statement and very hard to maintain because there's actually no jurisdiction on it. It's more of a soft agreement. And as of 2016, we saw the first clinical trials using CRISPR-Cas9 as a cancer therapy. It focuses on using the patient's own T-cells to target cancer. Now, the whole scientific world is aware of CRISPR and more and more research is being done to push it forward. It's up to all of science to decide what we do with this powerful technology. It has been used in a few cases to cure terrible diseases formed when babies are in the womb by deleting the genes causing the problem. However, many are afraid that we can go too far and start creating designer babies, for example. Do you want your child to be 6'2 with brown hair, blue eyes, prominent cheekbones, and a predisposition to be good at math? Coming right up! I think there's a line we need to draw to make it clear what we can and can't do. 
Obviously, if we can halt diseases, let's do that. But maybe stop far short of changing the child's physical and mental characteristics. We can also use this power in other ways, such as to change agriculture so that crops are stronger and have much more yield. But at the same time, we have to make sure that this is healthy for people to eat, not just an economic decision. The story of CRISPR teaches us a lot. It is yet another story of a few dedicated scientists and cooperation between countries and disciplines that changed the world in ways that we don't even know yet. As it gained more and more popularity, the number of scientists willing to take risk and study CRISPR skyrocketed. It also teaches a valuable lesson in that sometimes the most important findings come from the most unusual places. What started off as a study of the immune system of certain bacteria turned into a technology that can edit the DNA of humans, which may end up being one of the biggest discoveries ever. This may be a bit of a stretch, but to me it shows that no matter how insignificant, don't take any part of your own life for granted. Know that the next person you meet or the next opportunity you take advantage of may have the power to change your life. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. If you did enjoy it, I would deeply appreciate it if you would rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. This allows more people to find it. I don't know how the algorithm works, but it for sure helps. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. The phone case I have today is decked out with science and my closet is full of cool science inspired t-shirts from sciencesignal.com. If you're into leggings, there are also some pretty cool pairs on the site as well. So once again, that website is sciencesignal.com. If you don't need any more clothes or phone accessories, but still want to support this podcast, you can buy me a cup of coffee, maybe a Chipotle burrito, or maybe even a new mic. To do that, head over to my Patreon page on the website. This is what keeps the podcast and me going. Like always, I'm trying to get better every time I do the podcast, so if you have any suggestions, I would love to hear it. Also, if you have any thoughts about this podcast or ideas for future podcasts, let me know as well. Maybe let me know what I got wrong. Who knows? Just send an email to podcast at asciencestory.com or contact us at our website, asciencestory.com. If you're on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, drop us a follow. We put out even more content on those platforms. Just type in a science story into your search bar and we should pop up. All right, that's it. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and as always, keep learning.